your mom or um, said happy Mother's Day to your mom. This is your opportunity to remember that. After the service, right, we'll be on your phones right now. And again, happy Mother's Day to everybody. We're so thankful that you're here with us today. This is the day the Lord has made. We are to rejoice. We are to be glad in it. We are to be in his presence with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts as he continues to pour out his love upon us. Church, let's stand together as we worship and praise our God today. Second. 
chances, and I'm blessed to be married to my first love, you know, for 39 years, you know, it was such a beautiful thing, and I know a lot of you men can say the same thing, but I got the mic, <laughs> you know, I just, I praise God for each and every one of you, and I love each and every one of you, we love you, and uh, thank God for what he's doing in this church, and the preached word this morning, about the gift of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the fruit, but the fruit Oh, you'll be blessed, church, by the word again today. Oh, you know, when I was able to understand a little bit more, better as I matured in the Lord, you know, I was, you know, I felt like not only that I was sealed, but I was sealed because I was able to uh, exhibit some of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'm thinking, wow, we're so blessed to have the word being preached in season, out of season. You'll be blessed, church, and you will not be the same after hearing the word today. On this Mother's Day. Hallelujah. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way with us. We pray that we do not agree with what you today. That you have your way. That we'll get up and get out of the way. We feel your presence in this place. We know you're here. Even if we don't feel it, we know that you are here. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
circumstances change. And you're good all the time. Sometimes we have to fight against what our heart and our mind and our feelings would be telling us contrary to what the reality is. Lord, you are good. And nothing changes that. All of our lives you've been faithful and so, so good. And so we say thank you for that today. And we say, Lord, continue to fill us up. That we would not just know that intellectually, but know it viscerally, experientially, deep inside of who we are. Your goodness and your grace and your mercy to pour out upon us today. And we say thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. And uh, children are dismissed for children's church at this time up through first grade. And you can put your attention up on the screens and watch our announcement videos for today. Thank you so much for your willingness to take part in this work of sending Christian materials around the world through love packages. Through your assistance, we brought in 47 Bibles and 83 other forms of Christian materials, which gives us a total of 130 books that we will be sending out to love packages. Now, with this, I also want to let you know that thanks to the Cultivating Grant that we heard about again last week, we are sending these materials to love packages. With that, if you have some other ministry opportunities that you would like to be a part of, particularly with your neighbors or people who are associated with you, let us know. We want to be a part of supporting you as you see opportunities for ministry around you. Ladies, are you tired of sitting at home and doing nothing but cleaning your house and doing dishes? You know, we may be over 60 and have gray hair. Some of us have colored hair, but we're still anxious to serve God and others. I'm here to tell you about an exciting new group called Over 60 and Loving It. That's right, we're still good for a few more miles yet. Our first meeting will be held at Perkins on Thursday, May 19th at 2 o'clock in the back room. We'll have some exciting ideas to share at that time. We really do need fellowship with each other. So please come to our meeting at Perkins. May 19th at 2 o'clock. We'll see you then. Bible communities are meeting each Sunday between the services from 9.15 to 10.15 in the morning. Bible communities are a great place for all ages to connect and grow as they study God's Word. This is for the youngest of our children through the oldest of us here as we get together with people in our age category to study God's Word together.
by Father's Day so that we can support Life Choice Pregnancy Center through this. <coughs> All right, again, welcome. Happy Mother's Day. And um, it's, it's exciting to be here in God's house, uh, worshiping the Lord together. Uh, just a couple of the things by way of an announcement back on the table by the computer back there and then also downstairs if you're in the upper room and the table as you come in through the doors, you're going to see a variety of things. There's some cards with information, prayer cards you can fill out, put in the offering boxes, and um, you'll be prayed for over the coming week. Also, you, you can put your offerings in those offering boxes. We also have the online option through PushPay. Many of you do that as well, but a lot of different ways to give. And uh, all of that is contained on that back table or downstairs if you're watching in the upper room and the table as you come through those doors. Uh, a couple other things to mention is May 29th, the last Sunday of this month, we're going to have our annual um, Teacher Appreciation Slash Promotion Sunday. And it's during the Bible Community Time, so there will not be Bible Community classes, but we'll all gather together, celebrate all that God has done through our Bible communities over this last year, appreciating all of our teachers, promoting our students to the next grade level. Uh, you can bring an egg dish to share with everybody and some other things we provided, and we'll gather together and, and just celebrate all that the Lord has done through our Bible communities over this last year. Uh, Pastor Siebert mentioned on the video announcements, out on the table in the welcome area are the baby bottles. Again, we do this every year. You just take one, you fill it up with a change or, or dollar bills or even just a check uh, made out the Life Choice Pregnancy Center. You bring that back by Father's Day, and then all of those proceeds go to support the work of Life Choice Pregnancy Center. Two last things. Uh, this Saturday at 9.30, down in the upper room, we'll have our tea and testimony for the ladies. And so I invite um, ladies to come and be a part of that this coming Saturday, 9.30 um, a.m., and then the last thing to mention is uh, we talked about how we're going to be having our brown bag discussions concerning the church merger and what that would all be and answer questions. Second Sunday of the month. Well, today is the second Sunday, and my wife astutely reminded me that if I schedule a meeting after church on Mother's Day, I don't have to worry about merging anything. I'd be probably <laughs> done away with. So we are actually moving that to next Sunday. And uh, so next Sunday after the second service, uh, we'll be having a, another brown bag discussion to just uh, give further updates on where things are at, allow people to ask questions, answer to the best of our ability at this point in time. And again, just be praying, be, be praying, be praying, be praying as we're considering what the Lord is doing here regarding um, merging two churches together. And uh, so come prepare for those that would like to stay after uh, the second service next Sunday uh, for some further information. This time, I'd like to invite our missions director, uh, Marlon Casey, to come up and worship today. And you know, no matter what it is that we're going through, we go through it in the name of Jesus. We belong to Jesus. And the name of Jesus is the name above all names. There is power in the name of Jesus. We can speak the name of Jesus, and the enemy has to flee. There's hope and peace and grace and mercy and love. And I can remember times, you know, um, speaking of Mother's Day when um, our children were younger and maybe they woke up in the middle of the night and, and Julie would go in there and she would, she would rock them and she would just speak the name of Jesus over them. And she'd even sing that song, Jesus, Jesus, Mother Jesus, there's just something about that baby. And you've heard it. Master, Savior, Mother, Jesus, all of heaven and earth go crazy. Kings and kingdoms will not pass away, but there's something about that name. There is something
today. Church, here we are. Springtime in Wyoming. Now, one of the things that I've determined after living in Wyoming now for over a decade is that we really don't have spring. We tend to go from winter to summer. There's a couple of days in between, maybe, but we really don't have a springtime. We seem to just sort of skip over that. Or we get glimpses of nice weather every now and again. But then we're met with snow the next day. Let's not even begin to discuss the wind. <laughs> you know, every year it's the same thing. We get a few nice days of some nice sunny weather, some heat, and, and all the bulbs and the flowers and the trees in my yard, they enjoy it. They begin to show a little bit of life. They begin to, to come back to life after a long, hard winter by, by greening up just a little bit. Again, showing some flowers, showing some bulbs, showing some maybe some leaves. Inevitably, it happens. The snow comes, the cold comes, and all that was showing life just sort of withers away and dies. However, even though the early life tends to go away, they always seem to come back, and fruit happens. You know, even though the daffodils in my backyard made their annual one-week appearance a few weeks ago before getting destroyed by the cold, I know they're going to come back next year. Every year, I enjoy watching people get out and get into their yards and their gardens. Julie and I like to get out, start getting things ready, putting in all the work to produce something in a pretty harsh environment for growing things. And we do it with the expectation that fruit is going to happen. And this is in spite of the fact that, that keeping a garden is a lot of hard work. 
And for those who do not garden, you may be wondering, why in the world do you go through all that work maintaining a garden? <laughs> well, we do it because we know that fruit is going to happen. We know that if we put in the hard work, we will get to enjoy some fruit of produce or, or some aesthetic beauty from all of that work. You know, fruit happens. That is a true statement, even when things like our annual hailstorms that inevitably come and destroy some part of town. People's hard work is not in vain because even at that, some plants tend to come back. Life happens and fruit happens. And the fact that fruit happens is true both in the physical world and in the spiritual world. This, I know that I've, I've shared this before in a variety of contexts, but the reason why I share it so often is because it really is one of my favorite all-time bumper stickers. When I was at Denver Seminary, there was a student, he had on his car a little bumper sticker. It was just a gray rectangle with some white block letters that just said, fruit happens. I love that bumper sticker. Probably three quarters, if not more, of them had no idea what that meant. But I know what it meant. Fruit happens. It always happens. It's a non-negotiable aspect to living your life. You will bear fruit of some kind. This morning, as we continue our series through the book of Galatians, I, I want you to know that all spiritual life flows from the Holy Spirit and that fruit happens. If you remember from last week, we talked about how when you receive Jesus as Savior, you have been set free. And now you are to live that freedom out. And this is something that every single child of God needs to be about. When we embrace Jesus as Savior, we are now a born-again Christian. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. And God's desire for you as one of his children is that you will live a spirit-led life that results in true freedom. And as we do this, and we begin to live a spirit-led life, we are going to see evidences of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I want to focus on that today by looking at Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. This is picking up where we left off last week. We're in Galatians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 16, I invite you to just turn there with me and follow along as I read uh, verses 16 through 26 today. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Father, we come before you with hearts and minds that are open and ready to receive have for us from your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, you work it deep into our hearts and minds, that we would be different leaving this place than as we walked in. And how can we not with being under the authority of your powerful word? And so, Lord, we say thank you in advance to all you're going to show us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we see right away in our passage, what Paul is doing is he's contrasting two things. He's laying two things against one another and contrasting them. The acts of the sinful nature and the fruit of the Spirit. And as you consider this, it really comes down to what is your source? As you're looking at these two things, what is your source? You know, I saw in the news just the other day that Cheyenne Board of Public Utilities, they issued a statement saying that their water system passed its annual testing, indicating that our water exceeds the required standards for a municipal water system. I can 
tell you that's good news. If it were the other way around and the groundwater we were drawing our water from was filled with, let's say, some kind of cancer-causing chemicals, then I would submit you would not want to drink water from that source. If you want to find out about a body of water, you can trace it back to its source and you can find out an awful lot about that water. You know, I remember when I was a kid, one of my um, cousin's family, they lived in a house and they used a well for all of their water in their house. And it was sulfur water. That was the most wretched smelling water I had ever been around. They'd turn on the tap and the whole house just stunk horribly. They had to have water delivered to their house so that they could have usable water for things. If water comes from a good source, it's going to be good. But if water comes from a bad source, then it's going to be bad. And the same thing is true for fruit that people bear in their lives. If you are looking at some bad fruits in your life, you can bet that it's coming from a bad source. Paul says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious, and he lists them off. And all of these things that he lists, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. All of these things that he lists off, their source is from the sinful nature. You see, the acts of the sinful nature find their source in the sinful nature. That's where it's coming from. That's why they're sinful acts. Or, some would say, it's coming from the flesh, emanating from the flesh. You must understand fully that without the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, the works of the flesh, the works of the sinful nature are the things to which fallen humans will always instinctively gravitate to. It's their source. The acts of the sinful nature find their source in the flesh. In other words, the natural makeup of each and every person. Now last Sunday, it was announced that both the Creasel family and Julie and I had new grandbabies born. Amen. What a blessing! Amen. How awesome is that? And then we were joking around in the Bible community class last week about how sweet and, and precious and cute and sinful they are. Amen. What? Why would you say that? Well, I haven't told Ingrid and Jay this yet. I can remember when holding my children, they were brand new babies, and looking at them and, and thinking about how wonderful and innocent and perfect and sinful they were. And now I just smile when I see new parents going on about how perfect their child is, and they are perfectly sinful. As is each and every person when left to themselves. It's human nature. That's who we are in our makeup. Every single person. And as you read through this list of the sinful acts, I hope you understand this is absolutely true. When we allow our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions to flow from the source of our fallen sinful nature, then this is what our life is going to exhibit. Now, it may not be that you're out practicing witchcraft or engaging in orgies, but you better believe selfish ambition, jealousy, discord will be there. Have you ever been jealous over someone or something? Have you ever not gotten along with somebody else? Well, these are obvious acts of the sinful nature manifesting themselves in your life. You are bearing rotten fruit because it's emanating from the source of your flesh. Now contrast that with the fruit of the Spirit. In order to bear this kind of fruit, our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions, they need to come from a different source. Understand then that the fruit of the Spirit finds its source in the Holy Spirit. That's the source from which it emanates. Now we have talked about this before on a number of occasions. When you are remade in Christ, in other words, you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Listen to Romans.
Romans 8, 9. It's a verse of scripture we reference very often. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. If you are truly a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's the mark of authenticity. When you are a true believer, a born-again person in Jesus Christ, your thoughts, your attitudes, your actions, they come from a different source. And because they come from a different source, they will be spiritual fruits. And this is true freedom. We talked about this last week. This is what sets us free. Fruit happens. And when you are a believer in Christ, it will be spiritual fruit that lasts. Amen. Every moment of every day, we have to put the flesh to death. We need to crucify the flesh and yield our life to the Holy Spirit who lives within us so that we will live a spirit-led life and bear fruit that is pleasing to God. This is living a life of true freedom, church. This is where it's at. This is what Jesus set us free to do. It's for freedom we've been set free, we looked at last week. Bear fruit that lasts and honor the Lord in every single aspect of your life. So with that said, I want to take a few moments and discuss the fruit that we are to bear as Christians. And the main thing that I want to emphasize this morning is that we bear fruit, not fruits. We bear fruit, not fruits. It's important to note that we are to produce the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. In other words, we are not to pick and choose which aspect we would like to focus on and then disregard the rest. If that were the case, then we could simply produce that which comes easier to us while disregarding the harder ones to do. For example... Someone might be more self-controlled than somebody else. I'm sure we all have known some impulsive people for whom self-control is a hard thing. Perhaps they're simply more emotional than others, and they allow their feelings to dictate their actions and their mindset. Because of this, they may lash out. They may say things that if they had a little more self-control, they could filter their words before they flew out of their mouths. However... They may be a very joyful and loving person. You know, very often those things actually go hand in hand. People that are very gregarious and loving and joyful and just prone to that emotion also have a hard time with self-control because they're driven by their emotions and their feelings. But then someone else, on the other hand, they may have a great amount of self-control, but not much love for hard-to-love people. You see, if each one of these were individual fruits, then we would be able to focus on that which was just a little easier for us and still feel pretty good about who we are. However, the word is singular. We are to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which consists of all that is listed. Perhaps the best way to think about this is to think of a bunch of grapes as opposed to a piece of individual fruit. Grapes, they come in bunches or clusters, right? You have one bunch with a number of grapes on it. This is how it is with the fruit of the spirits. When you are a spirit-filled believer living a spirit-led life, you will produce a cluster of fruits which contains all that is listed in our passage. So if you were to look closely, you would see that the cluster that is emanating from each born-again believer, it consists of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The bottom line is we cannot focus on one aspect of spiritual fruit while disregarding all the rest. You must be a fruit inspector, if you would, who regularly inspects your own life for fruit. And, and what you want to notice is a cluster that contains all of the aspects listed in today's passage. And if you notice that there are some elements or some, some fruit that, that are rotten or maybe even missing, or you notice perhaps an obvious act of the sinful nature rearing its ugly head, well, then it's time to prayerfully ask the Holy Spirit, 
to do some pruning, to do some fertilizing in those areas of your life. Church, don't try to do it in your own strength. You will fail if you notice something coming into your life that is not honored to God, and you've got to analyze it, intellectually think it out, come up with a plan, and roll up your sleeves and get at it. You will fail. This is all a work of the Holy Spirit. All spiritual life flows from the Holy Spirit. And this takes us back then to the whole discussion of where's your source? Paul calls them acts of the sinful nature and fruit of the Spirit for a reason. You see, left to ourselves, we will produce bad fruits. However, when we allow the Holy Spirit to get to work, yielding our life to Him, we will bear good fruit because all spiritual fruit flows from the Holy Spirit. All spiritual life flows from the Holy Spirit. This is not fruit of the self-disciplined person. This is not fruit of the gifted and talented. It's fruit of the Spirit. You have to understand that the fruit which is listed is not a natural byproduct of human nature or of good people. It is the spontaneous work of the Holy Spirit in us. The Spirit produces these character traits that are found in the very nature of Jesus himself. They are byproducts of Christ's control. We cannot obtain them by trying to get them without the Holy Spirit. If we want the fruit of the Spirit to grow in us, we must join our lives in His. And this is what Jesus is talking about when He says that we must remain in Him, the vine, in John 15, verses 4 and 5. We must know Christ, love Christ, remember Christ, and allow Christ to work through us so that we look more and more like Christ and as a result, we will fulfill the intended purpose of the law, which, as we mentioned last week, is to love God and love our neighbors. This is the consistent message of Scripture. Now, I'm not going to take time to read these <coughs> Scriptures or even discuss them in depth, but you can certainly meditate on them over this coming week. And so, take a look at these verses up here on the screen, and I'm just going to make a little uh, statement about each one, but you can go ahead and jot them down, and then use this as something to meditate on, to contemplate on this week. Look at those scriptures, and perfectly ask the Lord to open your heart and mind. But we see in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, that the Spirit marks the beginning of the Christian experience. Also, we cannot belong to Christ without the Holy Spirit. We just saw that in Romans 8 and 9. We cannot be united to Christ without the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 6.17. We cannot be adopted as his children without the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 8.14-17 and also Galatians 4, 6, and 7. We cannot be in the body of Christ without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.13. The Holy Spirit begins a lifelong process to make us more and more like Jesus. Check out 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. You'll see that there. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit unites believers in Christian communion. That's Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So again, you can write those down. Check them out over the coming week. Read them. Prayerfully meditate on them. And see what God would show you of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. The bottom line here is that Scripture consistently teaches that all spiritual life both individual and corporate, flows from the Holy Spirit. And if we want to experience that, we need to live Spirit-led lives. Now, before closing this morning, I simply just want to take a moment and answer a question that invariably comes up when discussing this concept, and then also make a very quick, interesting point concerning the last verse in our passage for today. But first, the question. When talking about this concept, Someone will invariably ask, can a non-Christian bear fruit of the Spirit? Is that possible? It's an interesting question because as we look at the list, well, it can be argued that of course a non-Christian can show love, joy, peace, patience, etc. Right? It's true. But don't be fooled. Because what I would submit is that an unbelieving world will produce cheap imitation fruit. Not spiritual fruit that will last. You know, it's sort of like the difference between real fruit and fake fruit. When my girls were younger, they had play fruit that they would use in their little kitchen set that they had downstairs in our play area. It 
look pretty authentic from a distance. But upon close examination, it was pretty easily determined that it was fake. It wasn't real. And this may be the case when, for example, someone shows love to someone else, but the motivation actually for showing that love is to simply get something back for themselves in return. Or perhaps the fruit that someone shows is, is real fruit. It's love. I'm not denying that. But when you take a bite, you realize that it's, it's rotten inside or maybe no good. Or perhaps it's not rotten, but simply it's just not very tasty. I mean, early season watermelon, uh, it may be that way, right? It's real watermelon. It's fine enough, I guess, but it's simply not very good. Later on in the season, though, it becomes quite good. The bottom line is I think this through is that only through the power of the Holy Spirit are people able to bear good fruit that will last. It's pure. It's tasty. It makes an impact, and it makes a difference for the kingdom of God. And as God's children, that's what we want more than anything else, producing fruit that will last. And then the last verse in our passage today gives a very interesting warning. Paul writes... Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. We are to not become conceited. We're not to provoke. We're not to envy each other. Why would he say that at the end of this? It just seems sort of out of place. But I, I believe it is important because if we're not careful, we might begin to pat ourselves on the back for all the good fruit that's being born in us. Dripping with spiritual fruit, I am so awesome, especially compared to that guy. Oh, don't go there. Don't do that. We can perhaps hold it over other people, causing them to be envious because we're simply just more fruitful than they are. Again, do not go there. You must remember all spiritual life flows from the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with your great abilities. Any fruit that you bear, it's from the Holy Spirit. He needs to be applauded, not you. Fruit happens. It is a non-negotiable of human existence. The question is, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Is it good fruit that will last? If so, then it is flowing from the source of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. As you live the freedom that Christ gives you, you will produce good fruits, and you will begin to deny and diminish the obvious acts of the sinful nature. And I pray that this would be true for each and every one of our lives, for this church corporately, so that the city of Cheyenne can be drawn to Christ and all that he gives his children. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, we come before you with grateful hearts for this word, and Lord, it causes us to maybe do a little introspection, a little self-examination, sort of put on our fruit inspector hat, so to speak, and take a look. What's the fruit that's being born? And sometimes we've got to get down in there and look, sort of deep. And we might find there's a, a rotten grape or two on that cluster. Thankfully, we don't have to deal with that on our own. We can cry out to you and you get to work, you do some pruning, you do some fertilizing, you remove those things that are not of you, you replace them with things that are so that we look more like you and we are truly bearing spiritual fruit that lasts. Well, Lord, may that be true in our lives, in our homes, in our church, places of work, schools, so that people will see Christ and be drawn to the Savior of the world. We love you. Amen. I'm going to invite the priest to come up. We're going to close with one last song. You know, it really is all about Jesus. Jesus only. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's a beautiful name. It's a wonderful name. It's a powerful name. And when we belong to God through the name of Jesus, we will bear spiritual fruit. Let's stand together, church, and close with one last song.
powerful name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, as we go from this place, that we would go under the banner of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, allowing you to continue to fill us up with your Holy Spirit, working in and through us to produce fruit that lasts, all to the glory of your name. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, be blessed. Go in grace and peace. We'll see you next week.